test, test. Does it not sound, sound working too? The light's orange, it's supposed to be orange. Yeah. Oh, not green? Yep. Okay. <laughs> Guess mine, mine's different. All right. Good morning, everyone. So first, uh, reading from the Majima Nikaya. This is from the Badeka Rata Sutta, which translates to an auspicious day. I have heard that on one occasion, the Blessed One was staying near Savathi in Jetta's Grove, Anatha Pandika's monastery. There he addressed the monks. Monks, yes, Lord, the monks responded to him. The Blessed One said, monks, I will teach you the summary and exposition of one who has had an auspicious day. Listen and pay close attention. I will speak. As you say, Lord, the monks responded to him. The Blessed One said, you shouldn't chase after the past or place expectations on the future. What is past is left behind. The future is as yet unreached. Whatever quality is present, you clearly see right there, right there. Not taken in, unshaken, that's how you develop the heart. Ardently doing what should be done today, for who knows, tomorrow, death. There is no bargaining with mortality in his mighty hoard. Whoever lives thus ardently, relentlessly, both day and night, has truly had an auspicious day, so says the peaceful sage. So with today being daylight saving time, I thought it would be timely to talk about time. Perhaps the transience and impermanence of life is no more apparent than when we spring forward, like today, as we did earlier this morning. And many people bemoan the time change and loss of the hour. I think today is quite, auspi is quite the auspicious day to be um, mindful of our impermanence and mortality as the Buddha instructs. For none of us know when death may come. And to really take to heart his instruction for ardent and relentless practice. So when I was thinking about what to say about time, one of the first things that came to mind was the set of shout outs that are commonly recited during the 108 prostration practice, which are, great is the problem of birth and death. Impermanence surrounds us. Be awake each moment. Do not waste your life. And if you've ever done this practice of 108 prostrations, um, you know it's a physically strenuous and exhausting practice. And when I would do this, I found something really profound um, and deeply resonant about these particular punctuations that infuse a sense of urgency and focus. These four affirmations can be found and heard in many Zen temples, chant books, and practice. And many people attribute them to the 13th century Japanese Zen monk and founder of the Soto school, Dogen Zenji. Although the exact source uh, may be unknown uh, or existed in earlier Chinese monastic regulations and records. But nonetheless, Dogen's, uh, Dogen wrote much about ardent and relentless practice in his most famous work, the Shobo Genzo, or Treasury of the True Dharma Eye, which is a collection of 95 essays. And we find this written in the longest single essay in the collection, essay number 29, entitled On Ceaseless Practice. Here Dogen writes, your life of this one day is the life you should cherish, the skeleton you should prize. Thus, if your life were to last but a single day, if on that day you grasped what the nature of all the Buddhas is, then that life of one day would have surpassed many lifetimes spanning vast eons. So, if you have not yet grasped the matter, do not squander one day idly. This one day of ceaseless practice is a, is a precious jewel that you should prize. The late um, Zen teacher, Dainin Katagiri, one of the transmitters 
of Japanese Zen to the U.S. and founding Abbot of the Minnesota Zen Meditation Center helps to explain other aspects of Dogen's expansive and difficult insights into time in his book, uh, Each Moment is the Universe, which I have here. And I just want to share part of his opening chapter, which is titled The Naked Nature of Time. Here, Katagiri writes about Dogen and said, Dogen Zenji said that most people are not able to acquire the way-seeking mind of spiritual awareness without deeply understanding that a day consists of 6,400,099,180 moments. Ever think there were that many moments in a day? There's a number for it. He writes, this is a wonderful number. I don't know where Dogen found this number, but saying that there are 6,400,099,180 moments in a day is not talking about a mysterious idea. It is talking about something real. A moment is called sana in Sanskrit. Sometimes we say that one finger snap has 60 moments. So one finger snap equals 60 sana. A Buddhist dictionary may say that a moment equals 1 75th of a second. According to the Abhidharma scriptures, a moment consists of 65 instants. The actual numbers are not so important, but we should have a sense of how quickly time goes. According to Buddhist teaching, all beings in the universe appear and disappear in a moment. The term impermanence expresses the functioning of moment, or the appearance and disappearance of all beings as a moment. It means that all life is transient, constantly appearing and disappearing, constantly changing. You are transient, I am transient, and Buddha is transient. Everything is transient. Wherever you, go, wherever you may go, Transience follows you. Transience is the naked nature of time. So I'm preparing to um, speak today. I was trying to grapple with this challenging and mind-boggling concept of time. And I found myself quickly getting sucked into rabbit holes of quantum physics, astronomy, and complicated Buddhist temporal theory. In doing so, I realized a few things. Number one, the philosophical and scientific literature on time is vast and complex. Number two, I spent a lot of time trying to learn about time. Number three, I spent no time trying to learn about time. Number four, I really have no idea what time is or isn't. And number five, my brain hurt. <laughs> so while there were many interesting things I did learn, I'll spare you all the confusing details um, so that our heads don't collectively explode. But there were two other important things um, that I recalled in my preparations for this. And those came out of two other suttas, or Buddha's teachings. One in the Kula uh, Mulunkyovada Sutta, and this sutta, it's got a difficult name. It's basically instructions to one of the uh, Buddhist monks, the disciples of the Buddha, uh, Malanka, where he comes and he asks the Buddha a lot of philosophical type questions about the nature of the world, about the nature of life, about the nature of time. And this is where we get um, the set of the 10 unanswered questions that the Buddha did not respond to. He stayed silent. He refused to answer, including questions about, is the world eternal? Is the world not eternal? Among a host of other questions. And we find this elsewhere, too, um, in the Pali Canon, in the, Sabha, in the Sabha Sabha Sutta, the Buddha mentioned 16 questions, which are seen as unwise reflection and lead to attachment, including questions like, what am I? How am I? Am I? Am I not? Did I exist in the past? 
Did I not exist in the past? What was I in the past? How was I in the past? Having been what, did I become what in the past? Shall I exist in the future? Shall I not exist in the future? What shall I be in the future? How shall I be in the future? Having been what, shall I become what in the future? Where did I come from? And where will I go? So in essence, this whole talk might be a big mistake, talking about time. But this takes us back to the, our opening reading of the Badekarada Sutta, when the Buddha reminds us to strive for ardent and relentless practice today, because the next moment is not guaranteed. In the snap of a finger, it might not be. So I mentioned earlier how these um, shout-outs during the prostration practice often arouses in me a sense of urgency. In fact, in Pali Buddhism, there's an emotion that fuels our spiritual aspiration that many of us may not have heard about called Samvega. Thanissaro Bhikkhu defines the emotion of Samvega like this. He says, Samvega was what the young prince Siddhartha felt on his first exposure to aging, illness, and death. It's a hard word to translate because it covers such a complex range, at least three clusters of feelings at once. The oppressive sh sense of shock, dismay, and alienation that comes with realizing the futility and meaninglessness of life as it's normally lived a chastening sense of our own complacency and foolishness and having let ourselves live so blindly, and an ancient, anxious sense of urgency in trying to find a way out of the meaningless cycle. This is a cluster of feelings we've all experienced at one time or another in the process of growing up, but I don't know of a single English term that adequately covers all three. It would be useful to have such a term and maybe that's reason enough for simply adopting the word samvega into our language. So this past Thursday, here, we begun our four-week practice and study of the Dhammapada, which some of you um, were there for, and if you didn't have a chance, I'd invite anybody that's interested to join us this coming Thursday. The Dhammapada, as a concise encapsulation of the Buddha's teachings, serves as an ethical roadmap for our lives and emphasizes throughout the Dhammapada the same sense of spiritual urgency that is Samvega in many chapters. Particularly, I think, in chapter 2 on vigilance and chapter 11 on age. So a few verses um, from each. From chapter 2 reads, Be vigilant and go beyond death. If you lack vigilance, you cannot escape death. Those who strive earnestly will go beyond death. Those who do not can never come to life. Do not fall into ways of sloth and lust. Those who meditate earnestly attain the highest happiness. Overcoming sloth through earnestness, the wise climb beyond suffering to the peaks of wisdom. They look upon the suffering multitude as one from a mountaintop looks on the plains below. Well, sloth mentioned here and its partner torpor are one of the pairs of the five hindrances and mean half-hearted action with little or no effort or concentration. In a few verses from chapter 11 on age read, why is there laughter? Why merriment when this world is on fire? When you are living in the darkness, why don't you look for light? Those who have not practiced spiritual disciplines in their youth pine away like old cranes in a lake without fish. Like worn-out bows, they lie in old age, sighing over the past. Well, metaphor and analogy are powerful teaching tools in Buddhist scripture. As we just heard a few um, such metaphors and analogies. The one... Um, that the Buddha talks about in chapter 11 on fire, or on uh, age that we just read is on fire. The world is on fire, this idea. This image or um, analogy for me really, um, I guess you could say, sparked my interest in that it produces a very intense image 
um, and elsewhere throughout the Pali Canon of one's head being on fire in particular, and how this represents samvega or spiritual urgency. So I started looking in the Pali Canon and found at least four references in different places that the Buddha uses as analogy of one's head being on fire. One in the uh, Pena Sutta, or the Sutta on foam, F-O-A-M, like the emptiness of foam on the water. And the Buddha says, Thus a monk, persistence aroused, should view the aggregates by day and by night, mindful, alert, should discard all fetters, should make himself his own refuge, should live as if his head were on fire in hopes of the state with no falling away. And again, the Buddha uses this analogy in the Anguttara Nikaya as he's teaching about mindfulness of death and says here, just as a man whose turban or hair is on fire will to extinguish the fire with strong resolve, apply all his effort, vigor, and exertion. Together with mindfulness and clear comprehension, even so should that monk resolutely apply all his effort for discarding his evil and unwholesome qualities. In a third time, uh, the analogy appears in the Samyutta Nikaya, in the linked discourses with Mara on lifespan, where the Buddha refutes Mara here, then Mara, the evil one, approached the blessed one and addressed him in verse. This is Mara speaking. Um, Long is the lifespan of human beings. The good man should not disdain this. One should live, live like one should live like a milk sucking baby. Death has not made its arrival. And the Buddha responds and says, "Short is the lifespan of human beings." The good man should disdain it. One should live like one with head aflame. There is no avoiding death's arrival. Then Mara, the evil one, disappeared right there. So we see this reference and uh, image um, at least a few times um, throughout um, the scriptures. The vast canon of Buddhist and Zen scripture and literature speaks to our good fortune and the extreme rare alignment of causes and conditions to have been both born human and to encounter the Dharma. A striking analogy to capture this minute opportunity is that of the blind turtle, a reference found in the Chagala Sutta, or the Sutta about the whole. Monks. Suppose that this great earth were totally covered with water and a man were to toss a log with a single hole there. A wind from the east would push it west. A wind from the west would push it east. A wind from the north would push it south. A wind from the south would push it north. And suppose a blind sea turtle were there. It would come to the surface once every hundred years. Now, what do you think? Would that blind sea turtle coming to the surface once every hundred years stick his neck into the hole of that log? It would be a sheer coincidence, Lord, that the blind sea turtle coming to the surface once every hundred years would stick his neck into the log with a single hole. It's likewise a sheer coincidence that one obtains the human state it's likewise a sheer coincidence that a Tathagata, worthy and rightly self-awakened, arises in the world. It's likewise a sheer coincidence that doctrine and discipline expounded by the Tathagata appears in the world. Now this human state has been attained. A Tathagata, or Buddha, we can understand, worthy and rightly self-awakened, has arisen in the world. A doctrine and discipline expounded by a Tathagata appears in the world. Therefore, your duty is contemplation. This is stress. This is the origination of stress. This is the cessation of stress. Your duty is the contemplation. This is the path of practice leading to the cessation of stress. 
Great is the problem of birth and death. Impermanence surrounds us. Be awake each moment. Do not waste your life. Thank you.